I've been watching the WEF from Davos Transmissions and at the end of the week I'm going to make a video with all the key takeaways. However, I want to make this video because two things have stood out for me. The first being that every speaker, I don't think it's incorrect in saying that, every speaker has mentioned that we need to reduce our carbon emissions. That's not a new revelation, we've known that for years, that they bang on about it, it's a big election winner. The second one is that we need to be more connected, also not a surprise because nearly every country in the world has an active AI program. But I've been looking into carbon emissions and what they're proposing to do to reduce this and I found some inconsistencies and that's what I'm going to share with you today. We're told one of the main ways we can make a difference to our carbon emissions is to have electric cars. Now, this isn't going to be a choice, this is a fact and it's going to be forced upon us in just a few years time. You won't be able to get petrol or diesel vehicles anymore. Because electric cars don't have a tailpipe or a tailpipe exhaust, it's not releasing any fuels into the atmosphere, so obviously it's not burning petrol or diesel. but when you're talking about carbon emissions, you don't just look at the output. You have to look at everything that goes into the manufacturing of it. And the findings that I've seen, I'm looking at a Swedish study at the moment from the Swedish Environmental Institute. And the findings are quite well, surprising. They, they surprise me at least. Electric cars are light and so they need high performing metals. And it's the manufacturing of these metals that increases the, makes the CO2 emissions more than if they were making a traditional vehicle, petrol or diesel. The lithium ion battery used in electric vehicles is also a huge problem with regards to carbon emissions. I'll read you this short paragraph from the Swedish Environment Institute. It says the production of lithium-ion batteries for light electric vehicles releases on average 150 to 200 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilowatt hour battery. One of the smallest electric cars on the market, the Nissan LEAF, uses batteries of approximately 30 kilowatts per hour. Many new models have batteries of 60 and 100 kilowatts per hour. An electric car with 100 KWH battery has thus emitted 15 to 20 tonnes of carbon dioxide even before the vehicle ignition is turned on. The article continues to say that it doesn't mean that they aren't contributing to emissions just because they don't have an exhaust pipe. It just means that the source of emissions moves from the car to the power plant. Electric vehicles are charged via the electric grid, which is powered usually by fossil fuels. And the way it works is simple. An electric vehicle has electric motors that is powered by a large lithium ion battery pack, which is just like a mobile phone has to be plugged into a charging station. The electricity used to charge the battery is produced largely by burning fossil fuels or by generating renewable energy. The fact is that more than 64% of electricity in the United States is generated by coal, natural gas or other fossil fuels. But come 2030, I can't see many people needing to use a car at all because one of the other key things, as I mentioned before, was the move from what I call real life to computer life, it's digitization. And what Schwab said was that COVID was a facilitator in making that step towards their sustainable goals, as in making everyone more connected. And then he went on to explain about telemedicine and schools and universities having their lessons online. And he said, even when this is all over, oh, and I add, and that won't be for a long time. He said that he can't see universities and schools going back to physical buildings, that they will be done via screen. And the same thing for doctors. We won't be able to go to a doctor's surgery, but we'll be able to have a video call. Well, that's providing you have the technology to do this. And the idea is to have this on a worldwide scale, not just in a few select countries. So that made me think, well, if you've got so many billion people all online 
connected all the time, internet of things and all that. Surely that's giving off carbon emissions, all these computers and laptops and phones. And actually my gut instinct was right. And they do give off a hell of a lot of emissions. And I'm going to show you what I found. So the carbon emissions of desktop computers. Well, I found lots and lots of articles about it. All came out with the round about the same figures. Desktop, 200 watts per hour. Now, if a computer is on for eight hours a day, and if you think about it, these are students we're talking about on a global scale. They're going to be online for at least eight hours a day. If you take into account their, their lectures, their homework, you know, my daughter is at university and she's on the computer doing work at least 12 hours a day. Eight hours a day uses almost 600 kilowatts per hour and it, and it emits 175 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. A laptop is a little bit better, 50 to 100 watts per hour when it's in use and eight hours use a day 150 to 300 kilowatts per hour and the emissions is between 44 and 88 kilograms of CO2 per year. Smartphones 56 to 95 kilograms of CO2 per year. Now in a lifetime in the UK the average Brit and hasten to add I am not the average Brit they will use 1,610 kilograms of CO2 per year. And now that is the same as flying from London to New York two and a half times. One of the ways businesses have been communicating during this COVID debacle is via Zoom. I'd never heard of Zoom before this, but apparently it's a, like a conference call, a video conference call. Now, if your camera is on for one hour on this Zoom call, it emits 1,000 grams of CO2. And this surprised me as well. It requires three gallons of water. If you're sending emails, now there's the figures on the screen above. If you send these emails in one year, it's half a, just over half a ton, 0 0.6 tons of carbon emissions. According to OVO, Brits send 64 million unnecessary emails every day. Now, if we sent just one less, it would save 16,433 tonnes of carbon per year. That's a hell of a lot. But it's not just carbon emissions we've got to worry about. If the whole world is connected to the internet all day, every day, is the fact that this is a health risk. It's a, you're getting low doses of radiation and you can't even have lots of x-rays at the hospital because it's damaging. But if you're exposed to this radiation day in and day out, it's got to have a negative effect on your health. And if it does, you may be in a spot of bother because you won't be able to see a doctor if they get their way. You'll just be able to, like we have to now, fill in a form and if you're lucky that you'll get an email back. But face to face consultations are going to be a thing of the past and I think that's disgusting but that's not the only risk you've got the added fact that cyber security is an issue you could have someone come in and hack your medical records you could have equipment that fails you could have reports that aren't fed back to your doctor and you get delayed treatment there are so many things that could go wrong not having a face-to-face -face consultation is not on as you can imagine, a lot of the WEF meeting was taken up talking about the mass vaccination program and bio preparedness and preparing for future pathogens. They seemed fairly certain that within the next decade, we're going to see something similar to this. Now, I'm 50 years old and never in my lifetime have I witnessed anything like this before. But apparently, we've got this to look forward to all over again. So. With the development of vaccines for future pathogens comes research labs. So I looked into the carbon footprint of research labs and I discovered that they take, they use between four or five times more energy than that of an average workplace of the same size. And this is because they use reagents and plastics which use a huge amount of energy and generate a, an enormous amount of waste. 
Some of the largest energy users in labs are the minus 80 degrees centigrade freezers and fume hoods. Now this reminds me of the Pfizer vaccine which has to be kept at below 80 degrees. These freezers use about 20 kWh per day and this might not sound much but it's 65 times more energy than a regular household freezer. This energy usage significantly increases if freezers are not defrosted regularly. Fume hoods are another culprit. One fume hood uses the same amount of energy as three homes. Closing hoods when they're not in use can significantly reduce this output. In terms of waste, plastic and chemicals are a huge problem. The University of Exeter calculated that their bioscience department alone made up of 280 scientists used enough plastic to make 5.7 million two litre bottles in a single year. They have scaled this up to reveal that in 2014 the total plastic waste from the global 20,000 research institutions was approximately 5.5 million tonnes. Unfortunately the lack of lab recycling results in most waste going to landfill or incineration. As I was reading all these horror stories, I couldn't help but think back to my childhood. But not even childhood, even when I was in my 20s, 1990s, early 90s. We didn't have computers. We were quite happy writing letters to our friends. People nowadays, I'd say under the age of 35, don't know how to write a letter. We were taught how to write a letter to a friend, a thank you letter, a letter applying for a job. But that's all gone out the window. I like writing letters. And I, I still do it sometimes. I, I don't like emails. I probably send one every fortnight. Definitely no more than that. And when I was a child, the thing with this online teaching... They're not, especially young, I used to teach, and children, especially young children, need to interact with other children. They learn how to share, they learn to take turns. They're going to grow up emotionally stunted, and that, that's wrong, that's psychological abuse, especially if they're only children. My daughter was an only child, and she loved being with other children if she'd had to go through this when she was that age goodness knows where we'd be but education is about so much more than academia and the, the poor children nowadays are not going to get the experiences that i had as a child and probably you had and there's the play the play thing as well children learn through play I've got a friend, um, she's brilliant, she won't give her six-year-old, she's never given him anything other than traditional toys, so wooden toys, board games, he's never had anything with batteries, nothing electronic, he's obviously had to use a computer to do his lessons now, now, but no toys, just, just traditional toys like I had. We used to go out and make a camp in the woods. So school holidays would be out all day, every day, <coughs> on our bikes, going here, there and everywhere. But now they're just attached to their... F they get phones and equipment from the age of about five. In my opinion, that's wrong because you're just getting a child that sits there glued to their phone or whatever they've got. They don't interact. I don't think families on a whole interact the way that my family interacted with me when I was a child. It's too, I think it's gone too, um, I don't like technology, so I'm never going to be swayed by any any opinion on this. I, I think you, you can't beat writing a letter, you can't beat playing with traditional toys. You, you, there's no, they don't get any fresh air, they don't play in the street like we used to. God, we were out from, from we got kicked out when parents went to work and came home for our dinner when they came home. But no, I'm very pleased that I grew up when I did and I feel really sorry for children nowadays. So those are the two points I wanted to show you, the carbon emissions and the making us more at one with artificial intelligence. It's making us more connected. Globalisation 
everyone is equal, everyone will have equal access to the internet, everyone will have the same curriculum, the same education. Utopia doesn't work. If you've read Thomas More's Utopia, you'll know how it ends and it doesn't end well. I think we're being sold a lie. I've never bought into global warming. Ever since the age of about 14, I've thought that planet Earth was on a cycle. It all comes around. The Ice Age, the Bronze Age, Stone Age. I think that's all happened before and it will happen again. And I think the people, the powers that be, the Ursula van der Leyen and Klaus Schwab, I think they may know it. And the climate change, the globalisation, all of this the sustainability, the Agenda 2030 is all about control and nothing else. That's my opinion. I can't see it as anything other than 17 ways to control us. And <clears throat> if we're to believe what there has already been said at this meeting, that the pandemic, this pandemic isn't coming to an end any time soon, then I think we're going to stay like this until everyone's been vaccinated. There's there's a phrase that I don't even need to look up my notes for that Klaus Schwab said, and he said, until everyone has been vaccinated, no one is safe. And that is what I think is coming. We're all going to have to have the vaccine. Well, I'm really going to stop there and I'll be back next week when I've gone through all the main points of the complete five days of the World Economic Forum meetings.